Good evening. I'm Nigel Redden, the General Director of Spoleto Festival USA, and I want to thank you for joining us this evening in uh, our most recent edition of uh, Exploring Omar, a discussion series that uh, has now gone on for a number of uh, weeks. Uh, in previous uh, sessions, we've discussed Omar the Man and the context in which he existed in um, Senegal, uh, from, from which he was taken in 1807. Uh, this evening, we're discussing uh, operas. Uh, Omar, the opera, will be uh, composed by Rhiannon Giddens and uh, Michael Abels, will be given its world premiere at the festival on May the 28th uh, of next year. And I'm particularly uh, looking forward to it. And I'm, I'm also absolutely uh, thrilled to have the tonight's panel made up of artists whose work has been on our stages at Spoleto Festival USA uh, and who are um, have explored the complex identity of, of, of the subject matter of these operas in, in a variety of different ways. I'm very much looking forward to this evening's conversation. And without further ado, let me introduce uh, the moderator of the panel, uh, John Kennedy, who is uh, our resident conductor and director of orchestral activities, and will be conducting Omar uh, on May the 28th. John. Nigel, thank you, Nigel. It's great to be here today, and we have such a wonderful panel um, joining us in this conversation around complex identities in the arts. And I'd really like to welcome our audience here today. And thank you so much for joining us. It's going to be a really interesting conversation. And I'd like to start by asking you to use um, the chat in your YouTube um, panel that you're watching this on, and to take a moment to think about identity and share with us in three words, if you would, yourself. Three words to describe yourself. It might be doctor, woman, Charlestonian, for instance. Um, or to take, think about the primary identifier that we have to use in this world for identity, the driver's license. Here's my California one, you can't really see it. But, and to think about what three things do you wish we're on your driver's license that aren't on your driver's license. So if anyone in the audience would like to interact with us that way and share that, please do. Um, I think one thing we can see um, in, in comments and responses to this question of identity is how sometimes what society ascribes to us is so limited and in fact doesn't give us our full um, role in the world that we wish expressed ourselves. Um, and when we think about even something as practical as a driver's license in the United States, it's laden with meaning, right? All these layers of identity and meaning in that um, why should a license to drive a car, which we shouldn't be doing so much of anyway, right? Why should that be our primary form of legal identity? And of course, we know in, in the history of this that it goes back into the categorization of full personhood or not, as well as access to other forms of identification, other forms of access, other forms of autonomy, and even um, other forms, the right to vote, the right to vote, as we've just seen this year. So thinking about identity and licenses and, um, and how uh, this this is is something that has so much historical context. Um, so I would love to introduce our panel members now, and um, I'll start with myself. And I'm going to do this um, sort of in two parts. I'm going to give a brief introduction of everyone, and then ask them to talk a little bit about themselves on a more personal level. And I'll begin. Uh, as Nigel mentioned, I'm the festival's uh, resident conductor and director of orchestral activities, and I um, am also a composer. I, I have this name, John Kennedy, which is part of my identity. It's part of the burden I carry in a way. It's, it's both a privilege because um, I was named John Kennedy. I'm just digressing here, actually, because it is something when we're talking about complex identity, right? I was named before Kennedy was president, so I wasn't named for him. And it's a privilege in the sense that it's opened doors for me, I think, or accorded me a level of respect that I had never earned, right? 
At the same time, it's a burden in the sense that I think there are people who don't really look at me as an individual and for what I really represent without this sort of moniker attached to me. So that's how I express my feelings about my identity on, on just a really raw and open way, but how, um, how, 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 we, how we work, walk in this world, um, which is a part of the story of Omar that we'll be talking about. Um, so I join us um, as well from the East Bay of Northern California on land in which the ancestral caretakers are the Ohlone people. And my pronouns are he, him, and his. And for anyone who may be visually impaired, um, I am a white guy with um, no other jewelry or glasses on today. I have a long brown hair that used to be maybe a little bit more brown, has some gray shining through, so I'm not quite as shiny as I used to be. And I'm wearing a black sweater shirt and then a sweater with white and blue stripes. And it, I'd really love to welcome you all today and also now welcome our first panelist, Anthony Davis. Hello, hi, John. Hey, Anthony, good to see you. So Anthony Davis is known to the festival for when we produced his opera, Amistad, in 2008. And Anthony has been at the foreground of composing operas of uh, great cultural import and impact, um, including um, X, the story and life of Malcolm X. He also composed the opera Wakanda's Dream, which is the story of a Native American family and also delves into the topic of what constitutes full personhood. In, the, in this case for Native Americans, um, or the, the rights of being a full human being. Uh, Anthony, this year, won the Pulitzer Prize for Music for his opera, The Central Park Five, which is the telling of a recent story in American history. So welcome, Anthony, and where are you? you. Where are you today? Yeah, I am in San Diego, California. I am a professor of music at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, I, I think San Diego is a complex hist history in terms of, you know, who, who owned the land, et cetera. So you can go back as far as 7,500 BC and you see the La Jolla, who were actually Polynesian, who were here first before the Native American population, the Cuyamaca came, came to San Diego. Right. Yeah. Cool. Great. And you want to describe yourself? Oh, I'll describe myself. I am a, a black man, uh, African American, who's uh, with uh, I, I, I say a frustrated Afro that in the sense that it, it's not as fully developed as it used to be. Uh, uh, also, I wear glasses. I I'll have a kind of blue kind of I don't know textured shirt on. All right. Thank you and welcome. It's great to have you here. Our next guest is Adam Agoyan. Hi. Hey, Adam. How are you? I'm good. Good to see you, John. Nice to, good to see you. you. So Adam is known to festival audiences for a couple of productions. He directed the opera Fen Yi Ting in 2012 in a beautiful production in the Dock Street Theater. And then he returned to be with us in 2018 for a a very interesting production uh, called You Are Mine Own, which um, blended music of uh, Berg and Zemlinski uh, in a very, very, very um, uh, beautiful staged production. Uh, so welcome, Adam. Adam is, a, of course, a noted film director as well. He's been nominated for, as Best Director for an Academy Award for the film The Sweet Hereafter. And uh, for those of you who are in New York, uh, he has an upcoming event next month that begins January 26th at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And uh, it will be running there uh, a, a film called They Will Take My Island, uh, a short film collaboration with composer Mary Kamujian, exploring art making in the context of the Armenian genocide and conflict. So welcome, Adam. Hi, John. Yeah, um, I'm speaking today from uh, Toronto, uh, which is actually referred to as Turtle Island. Many Indigenous uh, nations have been here before, primarily the Mississaugas of the Credit. I was, uh, I'm um, identifying myself as he, him, his. 
Uh, I have a complex background. I'm Armenian, um, which makes me either West Asian or Middle Eastern, depending on whether or not you're going culturally or whether or not you're going geographically. Um, I was born in Egypt, as were my parents. Um, so I'm also, I suppose, in terms of birthplace, I'm from the continent of Africa. Uh, don't know if I identify that particularly. Um, I'm olive skinned for those who are visually impaired. I'm wearing glasses. I did have a shirt very much like Anthony's, but I was told not to wear it and to go with something black. <laughs> I'm slightly resentful, but, um, but I'm uh, excited to have the conversation anyhow. <laughs> That's great. It's great to have you here, Adam, and great to see you again. Yeah. And now I'd like to welcome Jennifer Wenma. Hi, everyone. Hi, Jen. How are you? I'm great. Great to Good. see you. So Jen is well known to folks in Charleston, particularly from um, the opera Paradise Interrupted, there it is, which we commissioned in 2015, a work she created with the composer Huang Ro, and um, a, a beautiful piece which they described as an installation opera because not only did Jen create the story, but of course also the, the design and the visuals of the whole piece. Um, and, and Jen is also, you know, she's a visual artist who works with a lot of intersectionality um, in, in taking her work into public spaces, uh, in, into stages. And for instance, she had an exhibition this past year in Charleston at the Halsey Gallery, Cry Joy Park, um, which uh, was an amazing installation, very immersive environment, and which also had a series of events attached to it um, called uh, dinner parties, if you will, called Invitation to the Feast. Am I right? Yeah. Right. And, uh, and in these conversations that Jennifer hosted, um, she, she gathered community members and activists to talk about issues of the day, including uh, issues, community issues in Charleston around systemic racism. So Jen, it's wonderful to see you again and have you here today. It's a privilege to be here, an honor. I'm joining you from Southern California, where the Uto Aztecans uh, used to roam the land. And um, I am Chinese born. I have long black hair with a blue shirt with a headphone dangling and wearing bright lipstick. My name, um, family name is Ma. And Wen was my given name when I was born in China. Jennifer, I acquired when I came to the United States when I was 12. So my given name was Ma Wen. Ma means horse. Wen means literature or language. So I'm a very literary horse or I'm of the language of horse. Depends on how you interpret these two words. And I am uh, she, hers, her, her, hers. And it's great to be here. Great. Welcome. And finally, our fourth guest today is Rhiannon Giddens. Hi, Rhiannon. Hi. So Rhiannon, of course, is well known to festival audiences. Um, she's appeared on our stages many times through the years. Um, and, you know, she's just a musician who has the most expansive sense of the possibility of what a musician can be. It's so inspiring um, how Rhiannon goes about her work and her practice. Uh, she's, a, she's a MacArthur Award winner. Um, she's recently been named uh, the Artistic Director of the Silk Road Project. Uh, and she's leading a pers perspective series at Carnegie Hall as well. And, you know, she's one of the reasons we're here today, because she's also the librettist and the co-composer of the opera Omar. So welcome, Rhiannon. Thank you. It's nice to be here with you all. Um, I am uh, talking to you from Ireland, from Limerick, Ireland, where Irish people have held this land um, for a, a long time, despite the best efforts of Normans and English to take them off it. <laughs> um, and I'm sure there was a group that came before, but they've been here for a long time. Um, and uh, I have light brown skin and long dark hair that ends in red. Um, and I'm wearing glasses that match the colorful part of my hair. And like uh, Mr. Rogers, I changed my hoodie to a black sweater right before this meeting started because that is the reality of today. <laughs> so it's really great. 
to be here. <laughs> oh, my name is my name is Welsh, actually. My name Rhiannon is Welsh, um, but I'm not. Mm -hmm. Great to have you here. Well, welcome everybody again. And um, let's let's start talking about this theme of complex identities in the arts. Um, you've all uh, approached it in so many ways, not just in opera on, on the festival stages, but in in many other formats and 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 artistic venues, of course. And I think what 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 sort of integrates or connects the work of of everyone here is one is an aspect of storytelling um, that you're you are all storytellers in different ways of of excavating and prioritizing certain kinds of stories which need to be told and using your practice as an artist to tell stories that you believe in and that need to be told. Um, and here we are having this discussion for a festival that's based in Charleston, South Carolina, um, a city with a painful history that is at the nexus of America's original sin. And the festival in this, in this discussion series, um, we've been exploring um, this opera that Rihanna is creating with Michael Abels, um, which tells the story of Omar ibn Said a West African who was captured and enslaved and then transported and sold in Charleston in 1807. And then he lived in captivity here in the United States for another 57 years until his death in 1864, before he could see uh, the culmination of the Civil War. And um, without question, Omar, Omar had a complex identity. Yeah, and this is a story that that um, that we are telling now, and I'd like to just sort of having having sort of thrown this out there about storytelling, I'd like to begin with Anthony because you've you've composed several operas, um, and most recently you've been celebrated for the Central Park Five, and what's interesting about that is that unlike Omar, where we're telling the story of someone who is so much in the past and perhaps the, in the extent of how he is with us is different. You're writing about characters who are still alive and, and telling a story uh, uh, that is still about complex identity, shall we say, because it's very much about mistaken identity or projected identity onto these young men that was in fact not their real identity. So Anthony, can you speak to that? Yeah, well, I think that's that's that was the issue. I mean, the idea of also how people try to create identities for others, you know, the otherness, uh, I mean, particularly Trump uh, in this case, I mean, Donald Trump was behind the whole campaign against the Central Fire Five and a central figure in their demonization in uh, in the press. Uh, and I think the rush to judgment that, and the uh, pressure that the felt that the district attorney and others others felt in the in the case, and uh, so yeah, so it was, it was interesting to me also because it was the beginning of Donald Trump's political career. I think was he you know exploiting the racial divide for his own personal benefit, which I think he that was quite evident in the Central Park Five case, and. Uh, so uh, I felt a real extra responsibility in dealing with, you know, five living uh, per, uh, men who now have grown up to be men. They're now, uh, you know, it's, my, it's years later. And I had the chance to meet all of them in Los Angeles at an ACLU. Uh, uh, ACLU sponsored a luncheon with and all the Central Park Five attended and my cast from my opera also attended and the cast of the T of the uh, uh, Ava Ava's uh, uh, TV TV uh, series so that was that was an ma amazing event and I got to you know spend some time with all of them and talk to them about it and I think they were they were they were bemused and excited that they were being represented in song and represented by you know in, in an opera uh, and I, I, I and it was it was very exciting I, I especially had a great conversation with Youssef Salam who's who's become a kind of important political figure I know now. And uh, so, so I think that, you know, that, 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 well, one of the problems is with, with uh, law enforcement is the, the assumption of guilt. They're this, they're, that they leapt to the assumption and they, they were trying to fi find someone to blame for the rape and assault in the Central Park. And they arbitrarily picked these five. And, 
And that, but the, the idea that this could happen also happen to anyone because this could happen to my, my son. This could happen to to other you know people you know and, and re realizing uh, also that that this uh, gave rise to, to really the Black Lives Matter movement, which uh, uh, Sharon Salam Yusef Salam's mother was uh, so engaged in in the political struggle after their conviction. Uh, I think that really set the stage for what would later become Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a wonderful story about um, you meeting um, the, the men and, and the cast members. Did they meet Did they meet the young men before they the opera was produced? Yes, like, we were in rehearsal, actually. Fantastic. And, <laughs> and, and so did that, like for the cast members, did that inform them or I like what was that like I think they were they were very excited about it they, they yeah. and I think it did inform them it, yeah. they, they did they did think about you know how how to represent themselves on and stage and, and 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 they had they spent time each of them spent time with their 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 the real person yeah yeah Good. And so, Rhiannon, I, I guess I'd just like to ask you then, in terms of drawing this thread from um, the, the opera Omar to an opera about the present day, and, and if you could share maybe some of your approaches towards creating, shall we say, or expressing the identity of Omar as, as this person, this subject of the opera, um, and and how how you think about that and and how you've tried to do it? Well, I mean, it's tricky. You know, I mean, I've spent so many years uh, trying to re not reconstruct, just trying to investigate. You know, early African American music, of which there is no recordings, plenty of biased observations by European observers, um, but it's very difficult to you know some instruments. Um, some illustrations, you know, there's all, there's, there's these ephemeral, you know, things that you kind of have to just immerse yourself in and then go like, ultimately it's always going to be a guess, you know, no matter what you do, it's going to be a guess because, you know, Omar has been gone. It, this is not Omar. This is our representation of Omar, you know? So it's, the, it's kind of the opposite problem. Um, and then there's all, all this, knowledge that people don't have about the time period, about, you know, even about slavery. I mean, our knowledge about what, 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 what went on during the time of slavery is so limited, is so shallow. Um, and so there's just a lot of, there's a lot of things that the, the opera itself is representing, you know, so, um, even the knowledge of the uh, amount of uh, uh, Muslims who, you know, were brought to to the Americas, you know, people don't even know that, you know, so there's a lot of that around it. And then Omar himself, you know, what we have of him is an autobiography, writings, um, and other people's description and, 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 you know, of him and even his own words, you have to, you know, have several layers because not only is he writing in a language Arabic that was not his birth language, Right. I mean, he would have learned it to learn the Quran and then it becomes, you know, part of who he is. But that's that's already a level, you know, and then it's he's in isolation, you know, for the most part. And he's, you know, and he's some he's writing a lot of this years after he's been in the United States. So there's there's so many levels. And then he ha he knows who he's writing this for. So, you know, what is he even going to say knowing who's going to be looking at it? So it's like you, there's a lot to unpack and. I, I just had to pick the the route that came open to me as I was looking at his words and raised his words over and over again. And, you know, I did some research, you know, as much as I could. I mean, you know, I'm a banjo player, but, <laughs> um, you know, d dug into that. And but I just really read his words a lot and and just let that kind of lead me, you know, along with having sat in this time period um, for a long time, you know, with my other work. So. But yeah, it's it is it is un Omar, and, and it, you know in this project, and, and if somebody else does his story, it'll be a different Omar. Um, mm -hmm. The and we don't have a lot of facts about his life, you know. I mean, we have a few facts. We don't have a lot of details. Even what he wrote, you know, there's not a ton of details. So on the one hand, it's like oh, I wish there was more. But on the other hand, it's like well, freedom, you know. I, I'm just I, I I have to 
I have to find the way through. Um, but it, it's been a highly spiritual experience. And, and so that's been really interesting, but yeah, representations, it's all representations. Yeah. 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 If I could ask Jennifer to, to comment about this idea of representation too, because in Paradise Interrupted, which is the opera our audiences would be perhaps familiar with, um, you dealt with representation even of the notion of paradise within a persona and and sort of a, a quest. And and I, I gathered that, that, that for you as an artist, there, that there was something personal too about how this was a thread in your work that you were moving from the visual medium into a theatrical medium. Is that right? Yeah, that's really well said, John. Um, I think, um, cause that work didn't start out as so personal. I was looking into the idea of paradise and utopia and dystopia as like a big kind of, um, research top, uh, subject for myself. I start my work with a lot of years of research before I actually do the work. So I've been reading about this for a long time. And I was looking at Chinese opera, the Peony Pavilion, which the festival audience should be also very familiar with since you presented that. Um, and then I was also reading about the, well, it's a long search, but eventually I came, um, decided to merge the story of this woman in search of her perfect love in the Pilni Pavilion and that of the plight of Eve, um, who was ejected out of the Garden of Eden. And I was imagining the story of this woman, imaginary woman, re or reimagined um, these experiences when they wake up from the dream or wake up outside the Eden next day. What would their experience be? So there's definitely that historical thread that was kind of our historical experience that I was trying, I was looking for. And the personal came later when I realized really the work we do, it's all about who we are because it's our interpretation, right? Um, so you can do as much research, as much um, uh, or as little as you want. Ultimately it comes through you. And there's this quite of an alchemy experience that happens, the creative process that's really hard to put your hands on. Um, that something happens, there's something transformative for yourself. So I think that was the interesting thing for me. And I met with, um, the point really was meeting my main protagonist that we ultimately casted Tian Yi, this wonderful performing artist that um, performed Peony Pavilion at this festival back in 1999, 2000. Um, early on, and was never able to perform in China again because of this performance. And her search for her artistry and herself. So, and then, so I was thinking I was writing for her, but it was not until the opera premiered, I realized how my life was tied in with this. It had to do with my own search for identity, my leaving my country at the age of 12, um, finding my way and understanding the um, all kinds of standards of beauty, um, aesthetics, both visually and um, theatrically, musically. So it's all wrapped into this um, way. But I think that's what's so great about creativity because it's not a linear way of exploring. It's all mixed in. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said. And I, I, I resonate with your point about no matter how much research you do in the creative process, um, you still are expressing yourself in like the in the finished product. Adam, you, I'm sure you can speak to this. You're you're a master storyteller in in your stage and film works, and and you've told so many different kinds of stories. Um, and and I'm just sort of curious, like how you choose your topics to sort of choose something that you want to point into the world to to reach audiences for a specific reason yeah i mean i, I guess the obvious project to talk about i mean i know we were talking about operas yeah but I, I would um and, and we could 
I made a film called Ararat, which was a, a film about um, the Armenian genocide, but it really it was about the transmission of trauma uh, over four generations. So it was uh, dealing with a survivor of the Armenian genocide. In this case, that was Archil Gorky, the painter, abstract expressionist, very well known, uh, New York in the 40s. Um, uh, uh, a child of a survivor, a grandchild, and a great grandchild. So it was taking place over four time periods, quite ambitious. But at the center of it all was this figure of Arshil Gorky, who himself is an incredibly complex character. Uh, that's not his real name. His real name he was born into was Vostanik Aduyan. And when he came to America uh, after the genocide, um, after seeing his mother die of starvation in his arms, after losing most of his family, he completely reinvented himself in New York. He said that he was Russian, that he was uh, the cousin of Maxim Gorky, the writer. Um, he completely, um, and this is actually, it, no one has been able to explain to me how he pulled that off. There were a lot of Russian immigrants in New York at the time. This was a person who did not speak a word of Russian, even from pigeon Russian from, uh, you know, but so everyone must have known that he was, what, this was actually a kind of a made up person. But um, his trauma was such that he kind of held that, maintained that. So within my film, um, you have this figure of Arshil Gorky. You have a, um, a person who's making a film about the Armenian genocide, who runs into a lecture being given by an art historian on Arshil Gorky, incorporates Gorky into his film. And then you have a, a production assistant who's driving home the guy who's playing the, 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 the monster of the movie, the Turkish kind of a commandant who kind of unleashed the genocide, who basically projects himself into this actor. And it's just like all these levels of representation, I guess. I mean, it's interesting because when I look about the projects, the two operas are directed at Spoleto, they, they, they also deal with representation, but through how we actually choose to use artistic references, sources, uh, what do we make of those sources? How do we reinterpret them? What gives us license to reinterpret? And yes, you're absolutely right. It comes back to your own sensibilities as an artist. You give yourself that right. Mm -hmm. And it's a privilege. I mean, I always remind myself of that. It's a, it's a great privilege to be able to uh, reinterpret and to presume and to uh, suggest something which may have not been the case, but which is true to you artistically. Um, yeah. Thank you. And you just queued up my next question by mentioning, <laughs> by mentioning artistic license, because I had begun this talk, you know, pulling out my driver's license, right? And, and like, in terms of the permissions we have in the world to do certain things, um, and who gets to have those permissions. And you mentioned artistic license, which we, we all have been lucky to have the privilege of having um, at various times in our careers, <laughs> and and so to speak, and and so, um, uh, who, but maybe you all have learner's permits. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I'll sign up for the learner's permit, Anthony. That's great. <laughs> uh, that's great. Um, but. I guess what I wanted to get to was this idea of who gets to have artistic license on some of these topics, right? Like, you know, and, and the historical revisionism that we see going on now, which is rightful in terms of reassessing pieces like Porgy and Bess, et cetera. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the create, and who gets to tell the stories? And I certainly welcome anyone to speak on that topic of who, who gets to tell the stories. Rihanna, do you have thoughts about Porgy and Bess? Oh, God. <laughs> so, many, so many thoughts, so many thoughts. Um, yeah. it's, it's ironic since I'm doing doing it uh, next, well, in 20, I don't know when it is now. It was supposed to be this year. Um, but I, doing it, you mean you're singing? Singing Bess, yeah. Cause I wanted yeah. to be in the club. You know, it's like, is, is there a black singer that hasn't done board game best somewhere, you know? Um, but I also just wanted to uh, crawl inside it because it is it is just such a, you know, problematic piece. And and like, I don't want to talk about it without knowing it, you know, inside and out. But I, it has been frustrating to me that that's held up as the black opera when it's not written by black people and it's not, it you know, it's like, 
not to say that there, there can't be <laughs> a story about black people. It's not written by black people, but it, and you know, there's all the stuff to say about the book that it's written on and, and based on and the, the research or whatever, the observations, you know, it's not to say that there can't be truth that in, in a piece like that, but how much is it obscured by you know, other things. And I mean, I don't, you know, we don't need to turn this into a pretty best discussion, but it's always, I'll just say it's been a big, as an opera singer, you know, I mean, not anymore really, um, but as somebody who was trained as an opera singer and kind of was like, that's the one, you know, that's the one we get. And I was just like, well, man, who wrote that? And I, I was like, you know, that's, I mean, luckily now that's changed a lot. There's, there's loads of amazing, amazing operas uh, about actual black stories, you know, and um, telling a different, you know, dealing in, in, in more real, you know, characterizations. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, that is a, we're all of us divorced from these stories, you know, where I, I, I mean, I, I'm, does it give me more license to tell Omar's story because of the color of my skin or because of the interest and the research and the, 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 the way that I've surrounded myself in that world, you know, because now I'm interested in that world because in part I'm descended from it, but that, you know, the, so I think, I think we have to look at these things in, in gray, in gray areas. I think absolutes are always bad. You know, I mean, who wrote strange fruit, you know, yeah. like right. people, people need to tell the story that they need to tell. Why are they telling it though? Needs to be part of the narrative. You know, why were the Gershwins telling that story? That's part of, of why it is what it is, you know? So I think that always needs to be in there and it needs to be part of the conversation rather than just yes or no. That's just my thoughts about it. Thank you. Yeah. Anthony, you, I brought it up. You had a comment. Well, no, I think, you know, I, I always felt it was important to reclaim history. You know, I, you know, that was important doing what I was doing Malcolm X and uh, Amistad. I certainly felt that the idea of, of also, you know, uh, telling our version of the story. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and that, 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 I think that that's, that that's incredibly important. Um, because the, the sometimes the white filtered version of the story is has is can be problematic even in dealing with something like the Amistad or something. So I so I I, I wouldn't tell the Amistad story as you know a few good few good white men you know story. I'm not I wouldn't do it that way because 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 to me it's it, the the story is much deeper than that and it deals with deals with with issues of. Uh, how how we wrestle with slavery and and that our, our, and that and that original sin that that haunts America. So, uh, but also I think it's important that um, to realize this this is not a limitation. It's a, it's it's an opening and not not something that doesn't close things. I mean, I, as a as a black composer, I don't I I wrote Lilith, which was about Adam's first wife, or I wrote Lear on the second floor, which is based on loosely based on King Lear because I was interested in, and and because uh, I we're, we're not one thing a person isn't one thing we're many things you know we and we and, and we we confront many things in our lives and we're not only defined by race we're defined by other things and uh, I and I think that that this is also to, to realize that what what we're trying to do is express our freedom express our freedom mm -hmm. it's the freedom to to and also also in expressing that to look at look at to re-examine history to re-examine history to 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 and and to look, recast history to look at look at those stories and how how it makes us who we are today yeah it's interesting also this question of responsibility right the, uh, so there are uh, there's a line that's drawn between the work you do as an artist where you're generating the work when you're writing it and composing it but let's say uh, in the situations where I'm asked to direct something, or direct an opera, uh, or direct a, a film, a script that's not mine. Let's say Era was a script I'd written, but I've directed films that are not mine. Or when I've been asked to direct uh, Feng Yi Ting at Spoleto, uh, um, was I the right person to direct that? I mean, it's a, it's a Chinese opera by Chinese uh, composer Gao Wenjing. Uh, it's dealing with a very, very, uh, it's a story that's coming from the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, which is this very, very, very famous Chinese literary work. Um, and um, then we started playing with it 
right? Then we started bringing in uh, one of the major visual symbols were these terracotta warriors, where the terracotta warriors are coming from the, the Quind dynasty, which is before Christ, like 200 years before Christ. The story that of the, from the Romance of the Three Kingdoms is coming from, um, oh God, am I going to remember now, the, uh, the, Han, the Han dynasty, right, from the th uh, third century after Christ. And it's being written in, 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 the, in the Ming dynasty, the, the literary source. And we're just sort of playing with all of those visual sources. Now, are we being irresponsible in doing that? Um, we felt that we were creating a spell, that it's a story about desire, manipulation, uh, courtship, um, the puppetry. She was the, the main character was this puppet master. We knew that the, in terms of Gao and Jing's com composing style that we had singers coming from very different Chinese opera traditions, uh, blending those musically. So there was a component where it was existing as an intact work musically, but uh, visually we were, I think you might be able to say we were actually relying on certain types of cliches, Chinese cliches, but trying to present them in an elegant way to tell this story. Um, and that's, that's a very interesting question to me, whether or not you're hurting anyone by doing that, whether or not you're offending anyone by doing that, whether or not actually that's a good or bad thing to be doing. Those, those, those buttons that you're pushing uh, might be able to actually provoke an audience in a certain way. Uh, but you just don't wanna be reductive in terms of what the core experience of the work might be. But even that's open to interpretation with Porgy and Bess. Maybe that, that, that needs to be completely torn apart and, and, and uh, maybe it's, it's ripe for that, right? So it's, these are, these are really uh, exciting questions and they are evolving all the time. Uh, I think you just have to do your research as you know, like you have to know why you're doing something. You can't just say I'm doing it because it feels right. You know, you have to be able to justify. Right. And I mean, this is what makes the arts such a dynamic stage for this kind of work, right? Because, because society is in constant evolution and we are responding to changing attitudes among our public and audiences at the same time that we have a responsibility to, to, to further that dialogue. Jen, you must have some thoughts on what the others have said on this. Yeah, I think it really is about perspective as artists that we're presenting. We're hoping that there is um, resonance in audience members that seeing something they've never quite seen before that re represents what's, what they felt, um, how they walk through life. Um, after all, we're not historians, we are creators. So that um, each generation of artists created for various reasons. As new generations come in, we have to represent our perspective as this. I think it's dangerous. It's tricky, but I do feel like as creators, we should be able to use any cultural historical reference. I think it's great that Adam worked on Feng Yiting. We are now one perspective richer for it. If it's always Chinese people interpreting Chinese um, work, there's a certain level of cliches there, right? So um, the world is enriched by it. Um, so the Gershwins had their perspective, but the problem is that if one becomes so iconic that it represents, it devoids other people's experience, I think that's a real problem. So how will we uphold something as um, definitive or put them in a temple of art that represents all kinds of black, white, um, Asian, Chinese, Armenian experience or whatever it might be is problematic. But making room always for fresh, interesting ways of how artists interpret. I think that's also kind of the function of the festival, right? You're always, yeah. that's what you guys are doing is to present these fresh perspectives. I mean, and, and, we, and we, have to have, we have to have connection to the material, you know, and there's lots of different ways to have connection to the material. I mean, I did a ballet um, with Paul Vasterling of the Nashville Ballet, and it was with Caroline Randall Williams, who's a black woman poet, and that the, one of the prima ballerinas at, at Nashville was a black woman, and so there was the three of us there. And like Paul, at one point, even said, you know, he because he was choreographing, and he kind of had the idea to even do it, which was it was called black, it was called um, uh, uh, Lucy Negro Redux about the black uh, brothel owner who may have influenced, you know, may have inspired Shakespeare to write the Dark Lady Sonnets, right? You know, Caroline took this idea and then we built this whole thing around her poetry. And 
he at one point, you know, Mahershala was like, I have, you know, am I even, should I even be here? Should I even be help? You know? And I was like, well, I, yeah, I was like, you're asking that question. So yeah. You know, it's like, I think that's a yardstick too, is like, if you are questioning yourself, if you are trying to find your way into why am I doing this material, you know, and then he realized there's, you know, there's aspects of being a gay man and, and experiencing how he's, he's been treated by society that he, you know, like these connections to being the other or being oppressed or whatever, there's so many different ways of getting in there than looking exactly like whatever the topic is, you know, and, and I think people feel that and then they find a way in themselves. I think asking the question should be a yardstick, you know? Yeah. I, I, I want to digress a little bit and speak here then, because what we're talking about kind of is, is gatekeeping too. And, and like, I'm the white man here and I am a gatekeeper, shall we say, in terms of programming. Yeah. And, 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 but the, how did I get to gatekeeping um, myself? I did it when I was young in 1988 by starting my own group in New York because I thought that the voices weren't being heard that needed to be heard. And so I, I self nominated, shall we say, as a gatekeeper slash artistic director um, by creating an institution that had as its, as its mission elevating voices that would otherwise not be heard. And and I, I, I'm not saying this um, to, to compliment myself. I'm saying it from the standpoint of, of what's going on in the arts community now um, in terms of arts organizations um, wrestling with their programming over the years and how it may not have been, um, may not be relevant enough to the present conditions. And we see institutions, shall we say, I've seen this done recently, and I just welcome your thoughts on this. I've seen this done where an institution might create a five-year initiative around equity, and that's between now and 2025. And for me, I just kind of have to laugh at that because isn't this the work we do every day? And isn't it isn't it what our our job is like? I feel like at the festival we we understand something. At least Nigel Redden has set this precedent for us that the medium of the arts is to amplify stories that need to be told so that we open our audiences, eyes and hearts to people that are not like them and, and hear their stories. And then maybe after you've heard these stories, you feel like you are more like them than you thought you were before. And, and so th this is, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm rambling, but I'm trying to connect the, this be yeah. these beautiful thoughts. Sorry, Adam. <laughs> these beautiful thoughts you all four shared about the artist connecting to the audience in and in, in in telling stories and and drawing this material to how 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 does how do we assert that institutionally through arts organizations as well. I think it's a really, here's a funny story. That's why I kind of like laughed. Okay, I, as a filmmaker, um, my goal, my dream is the Cannes Film Festival in France. So uh, as a young filmmaker, I dreamt of getting a film there. And I was, I've been fortunate enough that I've had several films invited there. And it's, an, it's, it's, the, it's the best known international film festival. And every year in May, it welcomes films from all over the world. Very, and very, very carefully curated. And the public, of, of the people of Cannes go to, into this huge theater and they watch films from, from all over the world. Where is the hotbed of the most right-wing reactionary response in France? It's in Cannes, you know? And, and, and I just, I've always felt that that was a real paradox. Like you would think that there is this great festival and it's to open boundaries and make people's eyes open. And yet in their own lives, they're incredibly insular. So I, I, I I don't know if, if, I mean, I think a festival is a great place for artists to generate work. It's a great place to, for work to be um, uh, presented in a market of sorts and, and, and uh, for people to, but to think that it, the festival itself is going to change radically the people that are um, living in that space is, is, I think it can work, it does happen. Um, it's certainly a name, but I think it, it, I think the, the, the concentration has to be on the on the work itself um, and how it can 
be nurtured for the artist and how that is a place of sanctuary for the artist. Um, and if the public are invited in and if it's able to speak to a public, that's wonderful. That, 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 that's the bonus. But, you know, work often finds itself being discovered in a different time. It may not actually, it may find its place later on. I was reading, uh, Anthony, about your opera, uh, where the first presentation, uh, was it with Amistad, I think? Uh, it, was the, it, was the, it was the remount in Spoleto years later where it was able to find its, its, its true voice, right? Is that correct? Am, am I right? Yeah, I've, I've, had that, I've had that happen. To, with Central Park Five, I actually had it happen too. You know, so that's it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, have some, I have an interesting story to add to that. I mean, when I did New York uh, X at New York City Opera in 1986, um, it was kind of an extraordinary event in that there were actually buses from Harlem with people coming to the theater. It was sold out for every performance. It was over 50% African-American house in Lincoln Center, which is kind of unprecedented. Okay, so my director, the director of my opera, Rhoda Levine, was having a discussion with Beverly Sills, who produced it. And Beverly came in, it was after opening night, and she said, you know, that was the weird, strangest opening night. And so, so Rhoda said, what do you mean? He said, nobody came. Now, nobody came because, uh, I mean, that speaks to our invisibility. Oh, that just says oh. too much. Right? <laughs> so that, that, that speaks to our invisibility and the fact that, uh, all, that also a lot of institutions give lip, lip service to this stuff. That I mean, they, they, they talk about developing new audiences, yeah. and bringing in a new audience, but they're, they're not really they're not really interested. They weren't really interested in that. That's not really what they want. And and, and as a result, I mean, they never revived X again. It was never done again. Uh, all all that stuff, and, and even though it was the most popular modern opera ever done at uh, New York City Opera. So, but but I think I think that so that you realize that uh, this is also a way of. Uh, there, there, there are pe the gatekeepers also are people in power. It's about power and about sustaining power, and sometimes about may, say, sustaining the same cultural system that existed before. So they were more interested in getting having a black audience come to La Boheme or Carmen than they were in developing works by by African Americans, because mm -hmm. because their goal ultimately goal oh we want to have more more more. Uh, diversity in our audience for what we do. It's not to change what they do, to, to change yeah. what they do in order to find that audience, in order to, to motivate that audience. And so I think, I think that, that that's a fundamental problem and that the institutions have to wrestle with, you know, like with, you know, certainly like the larger institutions like the Met or et cetera, you know, but you know, uh, you know, what, what, are the, what are they here for? And if they want, really want to develop develop a new audience, which they probably have to do in order to survive, they're, they're going to have to change what they do. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a huge, long, settled uphill battle. I mean, this stuff has been, the lines in the sand are now like cement walls. Like, so we have to, I mean, I'm a black banjo player, you know, like I've been dealing with this for 15 years, like ever since I picked up the banjo, not only learning the history myself, but you know, realizing how deep it ran, how deep the false narrative ran and why, you know, and it, all, it goes back to white supremacy and goes back to power. You know, people who are in power want to continue to hold power. So they'll do whatever they can to continue to do that, including up into including false narratives, false cultural narratives. And so when that false narrative has seeped its way into every crook and cranny of, you know, of, of American culture, of history, of history books, of, of media, you know, and and it it is that way with with other kinds of music too. You know, the invisibility of people who've always been a part of it. You know, the invisibility of people who've always been a part of America, right? It's all just a representation of what is going on at the heart of the American story, which is of of immigration, forced or otherwise. You know, and and indigenous people, and that's the story of America. But there's just one little piece of it that is held overall. And that is exactly what happens in the arts. So is, until we figure out how to dismantle, and it takes gatekeepers who are willing to open the door. Share you know, power. Share power. That's it. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. I get so far, it's sharing it. It's like, it's not that we want to then depress that one group. It's like, 
you know, there's enough to go around. But it's right. interesting to add in too when you're talking about uh, the banjo, because again, you, you are talking not so much about festivals, but about music halls, right? Like, 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 a, like where people heard the banjo was in this kind of pastiche version of it in music halls, because that's where, uh, that's where those, um, so the, the, the idea of where you're invited to play <laughs> and how you're invited to play, what the context is, you know, becomes an essential part of how we understand that tradition or where those big breaks are made as well. Like who doesn't get to play in a certain place? And uh, it's very complex, that's, that, this, this issue. Um, but it's, it's also interesting at this moment because so much of this is being transmitted outside of these physical spaces, right? Like, um, mm -hmm. so, so, so a lot more people can, can have access. I mean, I'm doing this, this piece that uh, you had mentioned the, I'm doing it the Met in New York in January was meant to be in, in, in at the museum, but it's not anymore. It's going to be it's, uh, it's going to be virtually broadcast, right? So a lot more people might have access to it. Um, so that's certainly breaking down those barriers. But then we lose that element of live performance, right? So there's a it's 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 not it's not the it's not the solution. I saw an amazing concert that Rhiannon gave here in Toronto at the Kerner Hall in a beautiful space. And um, it's, it's available now online and I've gone back to it and it's not the same feeling that I had in the hall. Um, it can't be, right? Because that, it's, it's uh, all those things are, it's so delicate how, how all these things are harnessed in order to create a, the act of transmission, cultural transmission. And we can't, and we cannot forget, I just want to add, we cannot forget that going online does not mean that everyone has access to it because not everybody has access to the technology. Not everybody has access to even know where to go on the technology. So this is this is a thing that we have to contend with in the arts world is accessibility and who is going to come to these mm -hmm. things. It doesn't change when we go online. It just shifts, mm -hmm. you know. And so we have to. We can't look at at going online as a panacea of any kind. You know, it's it's a way that we've been able to continue to engage with people, but there's going to be some of the same problems. I think I just wanted to say that because yeah. you know it is very fresh, you know, and, and what we're doing, but it's same thing with education. You know, it's, it's accessibility is always a problem. Exactly. And, and to talk about like cultural transmission, Jennifer, so you've, you've addressed this very proactively, like in terms of inviting people into the space of the work and, and, and might I ask too, like, it, it feels like from an artistic intent of what you're doing, um, it's, it's not just the, the, the art in the space, but there's an aspect to your work that becomes the traction it, ta it, it develops in the people who see it and, and, the, and the conversations that they have about it and, and how those conversations then inspire other kinds of social activity or change. Can you talk about that as, as a motivation for you as an artist? Yeah, um, so the project I did at the Halsey Institute in 2019 um, was actually inspired by my experience working on Paradise Interrupted, having spent um, four or five weeks in residence um, in rehearsal in ahead of the opera. And um, I just saw a lot of things living in New York um, I saw a lot of things that didn't register. I couldn't understand at first, just observing in, in Charleston. It's very segregated, for example, but it's like in this very beautiful um, setting, but there were things I, I was uncomfortable with and I didn't know why I was uncomfortable until I realized there's a very clear um, line of where the races went, how they traveled, the kind of work they did. So when the Halsey asked me to do a project in 2019, I asked whether it's okay for me because I really want to investigate. I want to understand that. And um, as an institution, they were wonderful to work with. They gave me a complete creative license, but it was something like, what is an outsider who is not African-American coming in, pointing fingers at an issue you may or may not have a perspective in sharing, right? So that's a real conversation. So I really approached it as an investigation. And um, in the gallery, I created these two um, adjacent gallery spaces. One is full with black paper, um, a garden that's very intimate. Um, it, it created this kind of immersive space, almost womb-like. And then you go through this uh, flower portal, which I called 
um, the uh, botanical birth canal, and uh, you enter into a very large space <laughs> that's very high and elevated with um, white paper creating this garden. The material is the same, but the white space is much more open. Um, it's the same kind of material, but depends on the intentionality. It creates a very different space. And then in adjacent to these two spaces, the black and white merged together over the ceiling. Underneath, I had that dining room table we saw earlier on the screen, where I invited over um, four weeks during the run of the exhibition. Every week, we had luncheons and dinners coming around talking about these topics of what divided the, the Charlestonian society. You know, I really wanted to take a kind of a more micro look at what was the issues here rather than a large nation, but obviously it was a reflection. So it was really giving the local, a um, lot of wonderful activists dealing with these issues. And each week is a different one, like um, children's education, um, land use of land, food distribution, um, re-entry into society after incarceration, all huge in themselves, but there are people doing great work on the ground. It's really bringing them together, having these conversations and luncheons where public was invited, dinners where these um, specialists talked. It was really about um, having platform, giving platform to have these conversations and celebrating people and shifting perspectives. And in the end, there was a very big um, symposium held with the many of the people who attended the dinners talking about each issue. And the ultimately, it was about systemic racism that um, all these issues intercross each other, that without dealing with these things systemically, you can't address things individually. You can't just talk about building grocery stores if you don't understand why grocery stores are not built in certain neighborhoods. People call it food desert. And I learned a new term, I think that was more appropriate, which is food apartheid, because desert is like almost like a natural occurrence, whereas apartheid is a, is a is yeah. a real uh, policy, right? So, but there were definitely some certain nights it was very intense, like very um, emotionally charged because again, people were saying, even asking the museum, why are you having, why are we having this conversation with an Asian artist here? Why aren't we represented? Uh, how are we only represented this way? And I do think there are legitimate questions. You know, every institution has to say, with the limited resources we have, we can only do X number of exhibitions this year. How are we gonna share these resources, right? I think it's a real question. Um, but I also said, well, what about if someone were invited? What if I didn't investigate this? I saw this as an experience here. As someone who is a citizen of the world, I turn a blind eye, say, Charleston's beautiful. I'm just gonna talk about the paradise part of it, not the dystopic actual reality behind this. What would that be like? So for me, it's always a two-part question that institutions do have to share the power they have. But those of us as independent artists, we don't operate in the same way in the institution. We have to create more space for each other to share resources and the platforms. And I just don't believe that as individuals, if we fell under the spell that one resource for me or for you is one less for me, if you have this win-lose situation with other artists, it's a huge problem. But that if you create the kind of work you want to see to share, then you can make beautiful work and other people to share that with you. So that's kind of... And it's a still open investigation. I can't say I was still, I'm still profoundly affected by that project. I, the upcoming projects, I'm gonna delve into that in other ways. I'm still learning from it. So it's definitely not a closed book on the topic. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I um, thank you, Jen. That's, um, I think there's, a lot there that um, we could learn from in the music world, actually. It's given me something that a lot to think about in terms of audience, shall we, engagement is the wrong word, but it's like um, taking, taking the process of the experience into a deeper level. So 
Uh, we're, we're, we've had a wonderful conversation. I'd love to keep going, but I'd also like to invite the audience to ask some questions. So for those of you who are joining us and, and watching today, um, please shoot your questions into the chat column and we'll see if we can take some of them, okay? Um, because uh, they're, 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 we've talked about a wide range of topics. Yeah. Um, one thing um, that I might ask about is, um, Anthony, you, you wrote this opera, Wakanda's Dream, mm -hmm. on a Native American topic. And, and what drew you to that? And, and what do you think um, we can do to tell Native American stories? I mean, you're an example of someone who has done so. Well, uh, that's, that's interesting. Uh, well, I was approached by Opera Omaha about doing uh, an opera about the trial of Standing Bear which was, uh, you know, uh, and that was a very important legal moment in terms of uh, recognizing the right of habeas corpus for Native Americans. Uh, and and it, it funny, in my own personal background, my grandmother was used to be so funny because uh, I, when I, when I was like in, in the late 60s and early 70s, when I was really involved with black power, embracing that, and I was calling myself black. And my grandmother says, you're not black. And I said, what do you mean I'm not black? I'm, no, I'm, I'm a black man, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then she said, no, you're colored. And I, I thought that she was talking, you know, some the, the anachronistic, you know, name for race. But she, in fact, it was because she was Native American mm -hmm. and that, that she, was, she was born in Red Bluff, California on a reservation. And that's part of my heritage too. And, and that, that I was, I, in saying I was a black person, which, which uh, I've really identified with as a, uh, individually, I, I was denying part of who I was. And, uh, uh, and, and this was, and so going, when I had the chance to do this piece, Wakanda's Dream, I was, it was, I was thinking about her. And also, also it, it was fascinating for me because I, they gave me the chance to really have a, to spend time with, uh, I, I went to powwows with the Ponca. I, I went to, uh, I had a, TP talk with the chief of the Lakota. I hung out with the Omaha and it was, it was fantastic. I had a, an amazing, it was a life transforming experience, you know? Uh, and I really felt, you know, at first I was feeling, you know, how would I, the idea of representation, I mean, similar to Jen in a way, cause I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in a sense, I'm, a, am I an outsider trying to represent them? You know, how am I going to do that? And, it was interesting because I didn't want to do the piece as Native American nostalgia, you know, the no. past. So we decided to talk about Native American today and being haunted by Stanny Bear, you know, having a child. And, and that came out of a powwow I attended. And I saw this little, a little boy with black feathers who was dancing. And I met, I spoke to her, his mother and she said, I said, well, you know, why does he have black feathers? He's so different from the others. And he doesn't doesn't, you know, move with the others. And, he, and she said, well, he has sight. And uh, he, sees, he sees the future and he, see, and he speaks to people from the past. And this was absolutely sincere thing. So I, I got into it with her and we talked about it and that became a real part of the opera and, and how we told this, the, the, the story in the opera. And um, so it was, it, was, it, was, it was fascinating for me and I, I, I felt, so welcomed by the by that community. I mean, they came and opening night to bless the stage, which was mm. what Medicine Man did, and uh, so I was I was and, and I I felt uh, it was so rewarding for me to spend so much spend time with the with the community, and and realize that, that connection, you know, um, and uh, and I think that the, the, that's something something artists can do. We we can be a bridge to other, you know, to bridge across. You know, the, I mean, identities are not meant to be fixed or to be bounded. You know, our identities are, are fluid. And so that, so that we, 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 can, we can serve as a bridge to across, across different cultural divides and also as, a, as an advocate. You know, that was, that was really important to me. Um, you know, some of the members of the board were upset with me when I did the opera at Omaha because I, I wasn't representing the, 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 the nostalgic look at that of the, of the Native American, you know, uh, and, and uh, I, I, 
and I, that, but I but I, but the Native Americans who came were very excited about it, and mm -hmm. so that was that was that was I, I and I learned a lot about the music. I studied the studied music, uh, uh, and uh, I ended up transcribing a little part of uh, an honor song from the Ponca that I used in, in the piece. You know, so that was that was a, that was really exciting for me, and uh, 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 and, I, and so, so to me it was a very uh, uh, incredible collaboration. I but collaboration not just with a company, but collaboration with a community. Mm -hmm. I know some Bronco Four songs. I was in a powwow drum called Southern Sun when I was when I was young. I'm in I'm in the club that you're in. So that's oh. that's so I, I, that's so great. I want to check. I want to yeah. I want to learn more about that. That's really cool. Anyway, another uh, great American opera that needs revival. Yeah, back in. Mm -hmm. yeah, I lived in Santa Fe for nine years and when I produced a new music festival there, um, I invited the drummers from Tusuke and Laguna Pueblos to come and play new music. I mean, their new music. This is how, this is what, this is what um, an expansive definition of, of community arts programming um, can be in that way. I, we have a question here for Adam. Um, Barev, how do you incorporate activism in your work? Uh, I mean, I, I think I think the activism comes really when the work is finished in a sense, and when it's released to the world, and you have to talk about it. You know, um, I, I don't think about activism as I'm creative at all, really. Uh, I'm just trying to be um, honest to what my experience is. But then you realize once you've finished it, you have to talk to the press, and you have to do Q and A's, and and at that point, you become a spokesperson. And you maybe shift, you know, you're you're not as much an artist at that point as as an activist. That was certainly the case with uh, some of the work I've done with Era. Uh, again, you know, suddenly I became you know, there was a screening of the National Library of Congress in Washington uh, when the film was released, and suddenly I was an activist. Uh, but that wasn't how the film was made. But part of the trajectory of the film is that you're trying to deal with the politics of what the film is actually presenting. And at that point, you get bent out of shape someplace because if other people have agendas, the groups have agendas, they want to present you in a certain way, and you have to respect that because you do have the platform. But it's a it's a it's a tricky tricky balance sometimes. I'm sure other. I mean, I'm listening. I'm loving listening to everyone. So I, <laughs> how do other people deal with that question of activism? I mean, I think Jen, Jen, what you were saying was so interesting in terms of these roundtables and these. Direct, you know, I, I think that's that's a that's a fantastic, you know, I mean, it's very generous of you to to give your time that way to to a concentrated group of people and being able to activate them in a in a direct way, and that becomes part of the work. The work actually incorporates that uh, so elegantly. Yeah, I agree with this idea. One of making the work, um, it's really about creativity. For me personally, it's about finding a hoping to find a universal truth. Um, <laughs> I believe in that if we go deep enough that we strike that core, maybe with other individuals, that it's through that we get to them rather than um, creating an agenda through the work, right? The work really needs to speak for itself. And that I, I, I like to the work to be seen a hundred years from now and make sense, you know, that does not rely only on context. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I really agree with um, once you put the work out there, it's like giving birth to a child and it now has its life of its own. But as a custodian, as an author, as a, um, a steward, you have to give context. You have to fight for its behalf. Um, so I think for me, I really agree. I, I really like what you said. I, in fact, wrote it down as you were saying it. <laughs> you're talking about Omar, right? Because Omar, I mean, that active... I mean, he didn't know that he was going to become an activist, but his act of resistance and the act of agency was was the writing, right? Was 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 actually creating this this documentation. So that I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been really intense, you know, sort of being in that flow and kind of trying to be respectful and be inspired by what he wrote and and to go this is exactly what he would have wanted. He wrote He wrote to be read, not necessarily by the people who were reading him right at that moment, yeah. you know, 
faith. He, cause he was very faithful to writing stuff from the Quran. Like he was very specific and, you know, I mean, he was, he, in some ways he was very specific. So there is actually quite a lot to work with, you know, in terms of, in terms of the, in, you know, sort of spiritual pieces. Um, but like that, I, in a conversation with the director, Charlotte, you know, it, that's where we ended up in, in, in it is that he's not talking to anybody on stage. He's talking to us directly. I just, you know, he steps out of the sort of narrative and then it is, I mean, that's cause that's exactly what happened. Like I, I, you know, we're all reading his words, like he's talking to us and now this is just another vehicle. Um, and that's, you know, I think that's the power of, of it. It has, a, it has a, a place when it's written. It's like Shakespeare. It has a place when it's written and it's a context when it's written that is understand by everybody who's alive then, you know, and then it's got this life after that, that, is the you know is understood the way that we un we can understand it in our time and in, in our place and all great art has the double lives I think yeah yeah and so we have time for one more question and and that sort of leads into it which is which is the question is is the makeup of the potential audience always a consideration when creating a work or how does what you just have remarked reflect on this question. If you build it, they will come. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> 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 may not be the present. Yeah, it may not be the present, right? Yeah. Maybe, maybe, you know, as another, you know, 20 years, 30 years from now, whatever, you know, so, and that debt you can't predict. So, so I think that the main priority in the work is to, in the integrity of the work, is to make something beautiful that says something that, that that ho hopefully expresses as clearly as you can what what you want to express, and and uh, in doing that, I think you're being honest with the audience. So I think that's the that's the thing that's the thing that's the most important is to being is is not not being uh, you know not being, just 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 being a, a prisoner of the moment, but also to be to be to be to free yourself to 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 to, to create something. That, that you envision, uh, uh, create something that that that, that expresses the uh, future. To treat the audience as yeah. beautiful. Thank you. That's I, a great way to wrap this up. Well, Jen, sorry. Oh, it's okay. If we're at time. Okay, that's a beautiful way to wrap it up. Thank you. Um, I, I really want to thank all of you for joining us. It's been wonderful to have this conversation. I feel like I've been at like an amazing dinner party. Um, <laughs> we should all had a drink. Yeah, we should have had a drink. <laughs> what's on? What's for dinner, everybody? And Rhiannon, Rhiannon, special thanks to you for staying up late. We know, we know it's time for bed. And uh and so thanks to everybody. Thank you to our audience for joining us today. Um, and, you know, stay in touch with the festival um, and our announcements about future conversations in this series. And we'll, we'll see you all soon. Thanks so much. Thank you, John, too, thanks, for a wonderful John. job. Thank you very Thank much. You. That was great. Thanks. Thank you.